So these buildings have been around as long as Osage, as we've been here at Osage. So we set up, I worked for the National Council, and from day one, we knew that there was, there was not only the council people there, but also there were other things there. You could feel it in the air. We just knew we weren't alone in that building. Because no one wanted to be alone in that building. If you went to lunch, so we're just closing down and we're all going to lunch at one time. And so it's just that sense that you know. So I could tell you day by day every story that happened, that something happened. Some days we, the oven would turn on by itself. Other days the temperature would get so cold. Other days doors would just be slamming upstairs. So upstairs is where the council had their offices. They shared offices up there. Down below, there's a big, it's a house that was made for a family, obviously. But we had set up the National Council office in the living room. There was a fireplace there. We set a desk. Uh, we had two desks that was there. So there was always myself and then an assistant. And we would prepare all the booklets for um, the council. They had their meetings on Saturday mornings. So on Friday, we would be running all the uh, paperwork for the next day. We didn't do everything like we have on our phones. We could see all the information. This is when we ran booklets out. So there we were running booklets, and uh, the young lady who was working with me, Melanie, uh, quit, and she had to leave because she her had young kids. And so I said, well, I'll stay and finish these booklets. Well, I had trouble with the copier that night. And so it was around almost midnight by the time I, I just had the last bunch to get done. And I talk about this story because we know that evil exists. And evil will roam late at night. That's what my dad said, nothing good ever happens after midnight. And I always remember that in my head. It's almost midnight. So there I was putting those booklets together. <clears throat> I had the I had my um, the music on. Um, this is when we had uh, you know just CD players playing our music, and um, just listening to waiting for uh, the booklets to be run, and they were like two or three inches high. There was a lot of information. Then I'd have to take it, three hole punch it, put it in there. But this time, all of a sudden, I could feel the room get really cold. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I went outside and, and um, it, it was fine. This was in the fall. I would say like Indian summer weather. It's where you don't need a jacket, but it's just nice enough and it's not burning hot out. So there I was, I went outside and thought, oh my gosh. So I went and I checked the thing, wasn't even on. So as I was sitting there, I, I was listening to music and then I could hear like right here on, on the side of my right side, I heard, have you all been to the zoo and you hear like a lion roar? That sound where it just bellows throughout the whole park. That's what this sounded like. It was this growl, this guttural growl. And I mean, I just froze. I just froze right in my tracks right there. And I was like, oh my God. I'm thinking, you go through your mind, you know, trying to figure out what could that be? Is it on the radio? Couldn't be. So I went and turned the radio off. Was it the copier? Did something jam up? No, it wasn't that either. So anyway, I looked at my keys on my desk and I heard the growl again. And my grandma was a very um, um, traditional Osage woman, Nettie Lettrell, but she was also a Catholic in her faith. And she said, when you're ever in trouble, you just say our father, just even just get up and pray in your head if you can, just say whatever you can. I couldn't even get our father out. I was frozen. And so um, that growl came and it came louder and louder. So then I ran over to the my desk and I grabbed my keys. I walked out of that door. I didn't, as usual, I would have locked all the doors up throughout, <coughs> turned the lights off and left. And there's something that told me when I got in my car, do not, do not look at that building. 
And so I, I didn't. And I could hear, so I, as I drove away, I just happened to look in my, I didn't look at the building, but I just looked in my rear view. And at the very top, you can see where that A-frame hits. That's a hallway. There was no lights on up there, but there was this red glow. And I'm telling you, I got home, called my mom, told her what happened. She said, well, you better call the police, tell them to go lock that door up. So I did, and then the next day, as counsel came in, I said, I didn't finish these booklets, and here's why. So I was telling them about it. So they burned cedar right then, went on through there. And that's just one thing that happened. That was, to me, the most evilest feeling that I felt the presence in that building. And so, um, you know, that building has seen a lot of people go through it. And I'm sure there's other people who have worked. Can you raise your hand if anyone ever worked in the superintendent's office? There we go. There'll be some more of these stories. Then the next story, I don't want to make it, won't be as long as that first one. That one was the, the worst. The second one is when... Melody and I were sitting there, and this is like springtime. So at springtime, we had the front door open, and uh, um, it, it was just really pretty in there at that time. And so we were working, we had our two desks, and there's flanked by a, we have a desk here, on the right and the left, and there's a fireplace. So we're both looking at our screens, but we're not looking forward. And in the middle of the living room, when you first walk in there, there's this huge staircase, and it goes upstairs, and obviously, and then when you come down at the bottom, it goes to the right or to the left. I think they boarded it up since then. And, but it had this orange, goldish carpet throughout, this big shag carpet. And so I heard someone walking around. I said, did someone come in to work today? Because some of the council would sometimes come in. She says, no, nope, no one's been in. And so, I was sitting there, and then I'm facing this way, so here's the staircase. And to my right, I see, I would say, every bit of a six foot three Native American, I'm saying Osage man, in a, in a morning suit, which is like, it had tails, and it was cut off right here, and he had a top hat on, a black top hat. And you could see that he had some kind of boot on. And you know how some people just walk down the steps? Well, he didn't walk down the steps. He kind of walked down the steps. And I'm, I'm then by this I'm looking, and then when he got to the bottom of the steps, he turned right, and he just disappeared. So I look over at Melanie, and this happened within, obviously, within seconds. I looked at Melanie, and I said, did you see, she goes, that Indian man? I go, with the black suit? She goes, with that big hat? And I go, yes. <laughs> So it was confirmed, we both had seen the same thing. And I go, where did he go? And we got up, we walked around and we looked. He wasn't there. There was nobody there. So that was the second scariest. And then the third one was around Christmas time. And um, we were, I was decorating, Melanie was typing, she was doing something there. And I could feel, so I'm standing and here's the fireplace right here putting decorations on it. And Melanie's about, oh, probably about where that end of that table is from where I'm at. And I could feel something tug on my on the, my sweater. And I looked like, what you need? And she goes, what are you talking about? I said, did you not just tug on my shirt? She goes, no. And, then, and I said, okay. Well, I said, well, something did because it was short because it came down from real low here. So I kept on about two or three minutes later. She goes, oh my God. And I said, what? She goes, and then she could see where at the end of where my sweater was, it was there was some movement that someone was moving it and I could feel the tug. And I said, I knew, I knew that someone had been there. But those are just some of the stories. I could go on and on about how I've taken people through that building and uh, and um, there, there's presence in there, and I think there's more than, um, there's, I think there's several entities that are in there. I, I, just, I just know who they are, I don't know. But we did do one little test. I wish Sean Standing Bear was here because he could back up this story. We were telling him, he was at the time, he was the museum director, 
he came over and we were telling him what was going on. And that he looked. and so he said, well, I'll tell you what you do. Let's get some salt. At the end of the day, we're going to make these little cones and I'll bring some Dixie cups. We're going to fill them full of water and we're going to put them all upstairs because that's where a lot of the activity was as well. So we went upstairs, went in each room. We all filled up the little cups, put them, set them out, little, made a little cone of um, salt, and then we left for the day. And we all said, when we get back in the morning, we'll wait for all of us to get here, and then we'll go in and look in the, um, and check it out. So around eight o'clock the next day, we go in, we go upstairs, one room, nothing, the, the little, um, cone of uh, uh, salt was not untouched. The cups were there. The next room it looked like someone took their finger and just ran it through that cup, I mean that salt, and knocked over the water. The other one, there was nothing there. Someone had just, it was just gone. Could never find that other cup. But this went all the way through there. And as soon as we left, we heard a big pop. Went up, upstairs and they had like these big round bolts down the hallway for, um, there were some, that had covered some of the lights and it had just broke. So that's just some of the stories. I'm sure there's others that people could tell, but thank you for listening. And um, um, I, I, I was at, I was up there for probably two years before I started getting into law enforcement. And so um, I, had, I was in charge of going and checking the doors of every building and if, and then also going inside of them. So it just isn't the superintendent's, it's the BIA office, it's the, well, it used to be the, what they call the White House, it's no longer there, it's where the uh, Wajaji Clinic is now. And then the uh, BIA building and also the museum. So those, I think there's more stories from all of them. So anyway, thank you, Chris. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, it's, a, it's a good thing my fiance isn't here to hear you say that. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Miloshka Odake, we are bringing. Hello, uh, my name is Noah Shadlow. I come from the Zanzoli district. Um, uh, my, Indian, my, my Osage name is Washoshe. That translates into English as a warrior or one who is brave. And I said, uh, I have a little people story to tell you all tonight. Um, this is, this is uh, my own experience um, from a couple years ago. Uh, it was about four years ago. Uh, this happened down there in the Hominy Indian village. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody knows about what goes on in that village, but a lot of a lot of spooky things go on there. Uh, but uh, this um, this is a uh, we had um, my my aunt Lois had just passed away, and um, we we had, uh, you know got everything ready and everything went good. Um, but we needed someone to go down there and watch her house while we were getting everything ready for us to move in there. And uh, my parents asked my little brother, he said no. They asked my two little sisters, and they said no. So as the Elompa, it kind of failed to me. I got voluntold to go down there. And uh, I uh, started just, I made my little pallet on the couch there, and I started sleeping down there, just watching the house, making sure everything was okay. No, uh, nobody got in there, or no critters or nothing. And um, the first two weeks went by, not a hitch, you know, there wasn't anything that went wrong. I felt pretty comfy down there. I, I turned on her uh, old uh, propane uh, heater down there, had a little fire going, and it was, it was, it was, it was really nice. Uh, I just enjoyed my time down there. And then one night, um, we, I was, uh, I just got done singing with some of my friends up here in Bahuska. And um, I, had, I, was, I got back a little late. It was about, I think, midnight, 12.30, we were like right after midnight. And um, I got, I took my shower, got me dressed, got in my, my uh, bed clothes, and getting ready for bed. I go to lay down and fall asleep. Around one or two in the morning, I, I, heard, I hear something skittering around. And I was um, thinking it might be a little mouse or something, because she had that old uh, 
um, wood uh, paneling in there, you know, that, that old, uh, old grandma and grandpa wood paneling. And I thought um, there was a little mouse uh, ch chewing through it or something, make a little hole, um, trying to get out and get whatever kind of crumbs I had laying around. Um, so I walked around and see nothing. Uh, and then I went and laughed back and laid down. And then I started to hear stomping coming from uh, um, the back hallway. There's a little hallway. There's the front. Uh, there's the living room. And then off to the left, there's this little hallway that goes back to the other two bedrooms and a bathroom. And I hear some stomping going towards that uh, that back bedroom. And um, I, uh, at that time, I like, like that's what kind of started to spook me. So I started. I got up and I looked back there and I didn't see nothing again and it was a little bit harder but I went back to sleep and um, then uh, maybe an hour later, it was about 3, 3.30 in the morning, I feel something tugging on my hair. I was, I was, and at that point I just started growing my hair out so it, like it wasn't too long, it was, it was almost like an like Indian mullet it looked like. And um, I felt something pulling on my hair and I snapped up real quick. And I see um, I see something scurry off into the into the um, uh, that little hallway back there, and um, after that, you know, I I took that as it not wanting me in there that that Milonska. so I got my stick my things together and I uh, bolted out the house. I didn't even bother shutting the door, <laughs> and uh, ran back down to mom and dad's, woke them up, and said, "Hey, there's there's someone down there. We gotta go check this out." And, uh, my dad, you know, I don't know if, if uh, I'm, I know some of you know my dad, William Shadlow. Uh, I, I, I woke him up and said, well, you, what, uh, what happened? He kind of looked up. He said, oh, it's fine. They do that all the time. <laughs> then he laid back down and went to sleep. Uh, suffice it to say, that was the last night I stayed down there by myself. Um, but that is uh, my, my Milonska experience. Uh, I, know, I know a lot of people have different Milonska stories, um, but that, that one's mine. Thank you. <laughs> um, so um, my story, one of the first ones I think I'll tell tonight is, oh gosh, it was about six months ago, maybe seven, no, it was longer than that. It was in April, I think. April or May, it doesn't even matter. Um, I had gone out to Cahokia Mountains, and um, for those of you who may not be familiar with that, that's um, it's over in the St. Louis area, it's on the Illinois state side, it's about maybe 40 minutes northeast of St. Louis, <laughs> and it's an ancient mound city um, that um, Osages and a bunch of other tribes, we, we all descend from those people about a thousand years ago, and they built these enormous mounds, um, and I was doing some research uh, for work. And we, I had gone out there for a work trip. <clears throat> um, and so the, the archeologist that was kind of taking us around, we stayed out there for eight hours, maybe nine hours that day, walk, just walking around that, uh, those mounds and different areas. And he had talked about what was on them, what they thought was on them, you know, things like that, and the research and the digs that they'd done. And, um, the first thing about that that I thought was interesting is that whole nine hours we were standing and walking um, at one point, and it wasn't even on the big mound. There's a really large one called Mux Mound, and I think it's the biggest mound, uh, biggest man-made structure besides Teotihuacan in the uh, Western Hemisphere. Um, but it wasn't that mound, it was a smaller mound that was a little bit older, and we were walking around by it, and I just, uh, I felt something or heard something and it just told me, just put your thumb on the ground. And I did, and when I put my, my hand down on the ground, it felt like the earth was moving. And there was, I don't, and I have a hard time describing <clears throat> this feeling because there, it was just teeming with energy. And it almost felt like, um, if I could describe it the way I felt like I could see it, but I couldn't see it, that's the other thing, I have a hard time describing this. It felt like things were moving back and forth really fast. But the other thing I also felt, and this kind of sounds funny when I say it out loud, but I had I could have stayed out there for 16, 24 hours, and I would have been awake and full of energy the whole time. And that was also a very strange feeling. I just never got tired when we were out there. So 
that's the main part of the park that we were at. Um, and then we went back into this area that's on the south side, I think it's the south side of the park, and there is a causeway or a road that was built by the people that live there. And it's basically a raised road that's made out of dirt, and I think it's like a mile or a mile and a half long. And just to see that uh, engineering feat of people who have made a road that's that long and goes in a straight line is pretty amazing. They needed constant access to this other burial mound at the other end of it. That's the theory behind that. <clears throat> anyway, when you go down that causeway, it's called Rattlesnake Causeway, we started to walk in there and most of the rest of the park, there's some trees scattered around, but it's pretty uh, open. But this part of the park um, has, it's a marshy, kind of boggy wetland area. <clears throat> and so there's a lot of trees, heavily wooded in that area. And we went in there um, and there was a group of about five of us that had gone in there. And um, when we walked in, the first thing I saw, um, there were about four or five uh, like does or fawns. They were little deer, they were still spotted, they weren't fully grown, and they were really close to us. Um, and so I kind of noticed that and I thought, well, okay. But that entire time, and we were probably back there a good hour, hour and a half, um, in that you know very heavily timbered wetland area. And uh, they would kind of go back behind trees and then they would come back out, but they stayed with us the entire time we were in there. Um, so that was the first kind of interesting thing that I saw. Then the next thing that we noticed, or I noticed, I guess, um, in some of these trees, there were these real big furrow, furrows, you know, that uh, had been burrowed out of the, the side of the tree trunk, but they were way taller than animal furrows. You know, they'd go up probably this high. And they were in weird shapes. They were in uh, like diamond shapes, or they would be, they would be like this, but they just didn't look like an animal made them. And so I kept noticing that as I was, we walked through, and of course, you know, the guy that was talking to us was talking to us about a thousand different things, but I was really struck by these, these trees. And then all of a sudden I look over at one of those trees with one of those big furrows in them, and there's a, there's a crane and a rattlesnake or some kind of snake, and it's standing up, um, and a squirrel and a fox. And they're just standing there shoulder to shoulder still as they could be, just watching as we walk by. And I'm thinking, that's so weird, you know, because snakes usually eat squirrel, you know, these, these are animals that don't get along with each other usually. And typically they're not gonna stand there as still as they were. Um, oh, the other thing, before I saw that first set of animals, it got really quiet in there. Usually you can hear birds chirping, different, different things, but it got dead quiet. And that's when I noticed that first set of animals that was right there. And they watched us, again, their, their heads turned as we walked by. And I thought, man, that's uh, it's unusual. Um, so then we, we keep going down this causeway and we stop, talk, you know, and then as the man, this man's talking, right behind him, about 20 feet, there's another set of animals that normally don't get along. They would be chasing each other, or eating each other, or fighting. Um, a couple of birds, like a quail, or a, some kind of, you know, smaller bird. Um, but it was, and I, that was, that pattern happened about four or five times as we walked around in there. And to me, you know, just from hearing older stories, um, I'm not gonna say their names, but there's, that's those, those LPs, those, those little spirits. And they had disguised themselves. And I wasn't afraid of them. I wasn't, there was nothing fearful about them. They, I, I honestly felt like they were just kind of glad to see me. Um, they hadn't seen anybody like me in a long time, I guess, or Osage, you know, somebody that they were, they were related to. And they were just happy that I was there. Um, but it was a real strange experience, it's like nothing I've ever experienced before. But to have these animals stand up straight and just their heads would walk by, watch as we walked by. Um, <clears throat> so we did, we left a little something for them. 
on our way out, just to kind of make sure that um, we were trying to be respectful and just acknowledge that they were there. So um, that was one of the experiences I've had at Cahokia State Park. So thank you for your time. Hello, all you scary people. <laughs> when I was a, a youngster, which was quite a long time ago, uh, apparently I had a pretty vivid imagination. Uh, and I used to see things. Um, sometimes these things would run alongside the car, or looking in the a glass window of the doorways, looking at watches. And uh, my uh, my granddad had uh, some milkies that were married into the Salty family. And the, the mansion, not the one on top of the hill, but the one across the street from the school. And we used to go up there and they had a, a, a bearskin rug. And I used to lay on that thing all the time and I'd use the just mouth was open like that. And I'd use that as a pillow. But I always wanted, it right there by the front door. And I always, always look up the front door and I could see somebody watching us. It's a man, his hair, I don't like to use that term roach, but roach is a bug or a spare monster. Cut like that. He's looking at us. <coughs> but I wouldn't tell anybody because I knew they wouldn't believe me. All of a sudden you're just making that stuff up. Just, so. And then my my mom's sister, her, her husband had a car, a 1930, 28, 29, uh, a touring car, uh, four, four doors, sedan, front seat, back seat, rag top, had plastic windows, you either snapped them in or, or <coughs> zipped them out to get which. And so we used to go out towards the Great Horse, <clears throat> I stare by where his parents lived, and I'd look out the window and I could see a man running along beside us. Same kind of guy. And I thought, well, what's he running along? Why don't just get on a running board and just hitch a ride? You know? I didn't tell anybody about that either. And then one day, years later, and I used to hear people talk about the little people, the hairy man, and depending on where I am and who I'm talking to, I call him, <coughs> around here I'll call him the hairy man, I don't call him Sasquatch or Bigfoot, other people do. I got a friend of mine, she says she's from up north, up in the northern Nevada and southern Idaho. She says those people have songs about them, and they they talk to, talk about them like they were real people. And maybe they are, I don't know. Um, but a few years ago, uh, I was in my car, I don't remember which car, and if I could tell you, remember which car I was in, I could tell you about when this happened. Uh, I'm driving east on Highway 20 going going to Omni, or going towards Omni, and uh, I've never seen it. My mom said, oh, there's no such thing as a hairy man, but my mom used to tell us that to make his kids come in at, at night time. Other people say, well, yeah, there is such a thing, because I know people who knew people who saw one. Okay, you know. So I've always been skeptical. I'm a lot less skeptical now. Um, because there's just, these, these, these creatures have been seen all over the world. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm driving down Highway 20 east towards uh, Omni, and there's a little hitch in the road, and you get down there, and you kind of turn, it's kind of south, you're going southeast then, but you turn more southeast, you go down the hill towards Sycamore Creek, and then across the creek is uh, Nappy, Nappy's house. But that barbed wire fence line just keeps going straight. And there's a couple of big trees there. And I looked at them this morning, this afternoon, and there's a smaller tree there. And there he was. Now, I'm not making this up. And I looked, I hit the brakes, I looked at the rearview mirror, all of my mirrors, trying to see, did I see what I think I saw? Well, by then, when you're doing 60, 65 miles an hour, well, you're, they're out of your vision. So, and I didn't see anymore. So, and then people, but they asked me years later, they said, did you see what you thought you saw? I said, well, I think I did. I don't know, but I think I did. And I could describe him. Nobody in here looks like that, let me tell you. Uh, very tall, very big, very thick neck, long, coarse, kind of a brown <coughs> hair, light brown hair. Looked like he ought to be playing the tackle for the Green Bay Packers or something like that. 
But I couldn't see him from the front, so I don't, can't tell you what his face was like. It was only from the back. A big, hairy guy. Coarse hair. And then I'm, I'm going down the road, and I slow down a little bit, and I get to a Sycamore Creek. I just keep on going. I'm going to Homely. But every time I go by there, or like I did twice this morning, uh, I think about that. Wasn't scared, nothing. It's kind of surprised. Did I see, did I really see what I think I saw? Well, I think I did. So, what he was doing out there, I don't know, you know. But some other time, he's standing under a tree. That's what he was doing, he was standing underneath a tree. Another time, a few years ago, me and a couple of friends of mine were out west of Fairfax. We're down to nine miles from nowhere out there, west of Fairfax. And right west of where we were is a big, deep ravine with real steep sides. And <clears throat> I was hunting in the big rock, what we call the big rocks. And I uh, thought, well, shoot, I'm going in. Time to go to lunch and what? That's the way we deer hunt. We go out there, sit around, and go to lunch. And <clears throat> so I'll get back to pick up, and we're waiting on the third, the third member of our party to come in. And we hear that real loud scream. A roar like that. They said, what was that? I said, I don't know. You gotta go find out? No. Do you? No. <laughs> and I said, I'll tell you what it sounded like. It sounded like people who crunch coyotes and stuff, they have these little coyote calls. That's a, a distress, rabbit in distress or something like this. And the coyotes will come and they'll look for it and then they get shot for the trouble. Well, this sounded to me like something that was in distress. That was hurt, that was injured, like it could have fallen off into that deep ravine that was, had a broken leg or something like this. But we never did go see him. So the third member of our party came in, he said, well, Why don't you go see him? It was because it's scary. If we got guns, why not be enough? You know? <laughs> so we didn't go see him. And then the they this guy's sister, if she owned that property, she wouldn't let us come out there any more. So serve her right. Maybe she'll get eaten by those things. Who knows? <laughs> but that is about the tale of the tale of my tale. Is, is I think I saw what I saw. Um, when my grandpa was alive, he was born in 1890. They talk about stuff like this, and we go up north and north north of Pawhuska here to go fishing. We'd stay out there for several days at a time. And I was never afraid because my grandpa, I was with my grandpa. He knew everything. Him and his brother, they, they knew everything. Except one time when a storm comes through and it's real loud noise, a real cold wind. And it was a hail storm. It, that cold wind was the, the wind coming off the hail. I'm more scared of that than I was what I thought I saw going on. And then several years later, I figured out that those real long, the real long hailstones that you see, they're associated with tornadoes because they keep circulating the rain and the hail and keep going up and they get too heavy to circulate and they fall. And then they're, they're associated with tornadoes. But anyway, so I haven't seen anything like that. Never have seen little people. Um, I've seen all kinds of wild animals out there and anymore. When I go out to the woods out there by the river and out there in the bend, I, I go armed. I take a gun with me because there are things, there are animals out there that can, can eat you, kill you and eat you. They're hogs, wild hogs. And uh, so I don't have to see those. I see where they've been, where they've ridden around and ate stuff. But we have a guy who's got that lease and he goes out there and he kills them and processes and makes them ribs and hams and bacon and all sorts of stuff. But anyway, that's all I know. Any questions? I'm not going to answer them. But you got any questions? <laughs> all right. Thank you. It's Anya, by the way. Sorry. What? Sorry. I'm getting my whole life. Um, his story is no match for the LP stories, the dear woman stories. I, this is don't expect much <laughs> from this story, all right? Um, this story actually happened around four years ago. It was for my 11th birthday. Um, it was a Stranger Things themed birthday party um, in the 80s. So we had this 
my mom, she has this uh, building. Um, it's this two-story building. Downstairs is like a gallery, the big grand gallery, most of you probably know. And then upstairs is the Airbnb. Um, so the plan was, we were gonna have the party downstairs with like family and stuff like that. And upstairs was gonna be like the little slumber party, whatever, with a bunch of cousins. Um, and people were like sleeping on the floor. There was like 10 of my cousins and like my friends and stuff. So everyone was just pick a spot, lay down, grab a blanket. And it was like, <laughs> it was after the party. We went upstairs, it was like one or two o'clock in the morning. And my mom was there, she's like, go to sleep. I'm done with all the yelling. And we were like, okay. Um, so we all kind of picked a spot and we laid on the ground and we you know, fell asleep. Uh, a couple of people got up to use the bathroom, but that's about it. Um, but the, the next morning we were all talking and we all heard somebody get up and go to the kitchen and they were just pacing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for like 30 minutes. And she was like, who went into the kitchen and was pacing back and forth? Who, who was doing that? And uh, we were all like, well, we were gonna ask you. We, nobody went into the kitchen. So, freaked me and my friends out. Um, and then there's a couple other little things here. That, this is not an evil spirit. She's, you know, pretty chill. She moves stuff around sometimes. Um, my mom and I, we were walking upstairs one time. Um, nobody was in the building and we hear the loudest so, it was a uh, ghost with a cold. <laughs> we go upstairs, nobody's there. We should really leave it to tissue box. Um, and then my mom told me this story. Uh, she was upstairs and she was fixing th some things and we used to have a piano downstairs. Um, and she heard somebody kind of like, she. That person wasn't really playing a song, they were just kind of like fiddling with the keys, and she's like, oh, the electrician must be here, just like, I'm just curious. Um, and then the second she got downstairs, the electrician pulled up, and there was nobody there. And she was like, you didn't, you weren't fishing with a piano? And he was like, no, that wasn't me. She's like, great! <laughs> so we just had a couple little, Bumps in the night, nothing much, nothing compared to seeing LPs. I'm not ready for that day to come. Anyway, that's, that's it. That's pretty much it. Thank you. I don't need a chair. Wajaji jaji wita pa pa ho. Da wa la wita si jo wa shtake. Sa da wa hu jaji wita wa kuere. Da go tiere. I'm Tali, I'm from the Pahuska, Oaxacaali people. And I just want to tell you three quick stories. Our sister asked me when I walked in. Uh, Y'all see this building here? I work for the tribe. And we do a lot of construction. And I like this building. I know every window in this. I've measured every opening, every doorway. And this old porch here, it's not, it was built later. So the original is, just looks like this without that porch. And then this is a, a widow walk, they call it. And that needs to come off. So we hired a company to come over and fix it up, redo the pointing on the stonework. And, Make sure the structure was good and solid, get the roof in place because they want to do things on the inside. So I got my orders from my boss and the key. Not too long ago, we just finished this project. And I drove the tribal vehicle up there. And when I pulled up, Casey was walking this. He was walking around looking in all the windows. So I got out of my car and I walked up. I said, what's going on? And then he said, somebody in the police department, the Husker, called them over at the main office and said there's a woman in there trapped and can't get out. 
He said, walk around the base, I'll be up here. And I walked all the way around. We looked and we opened the door, we walked in, nobody. I remember looking at the building over here, the main office, and everybody's looking. <laughs> so true story. The second one I want to tell is just, a, I was lead singing in a punk church, or a head, I was after Doug Eagle, and he loved the Dallas Cowboys, so I'd go and sing songs of their, their way, and one night we all left, we were crowded like this, we were singing all those Indian hymns and talking and praying, and so I walked out here, well, I left my jacket, so, I went back to that church. It was just dark. And I walked up to that church door and I pulled that door. As soon as I pulled it, I heard it. an old man start talking in that church, yelling stuff in Indian. And I stopped and then I heard whatever he said, that whole church erupted and repeated exactly what he said. It's all pitch black and everything just went quiet. So I just walked in, grabbed my jacket, and I ran out. <laughs> and then if y'all, who all goes down to 60, Highway 60? There's a lot going on on that flashing light. Do y'all notice that? Anybody? I've seen people standing in the road. I've seen people sitting on that bridge in the middle of the night. I don't know if anybody's seen that. Put your hands up if you've seen kind of strange things out there. So anyway, I always had, but my last one was my brother-in-law. He married a woman out west, and he was driving out to see his kids out in the middle of nowhere. And he said, I just pulled over, and there was a rock off the side of the highway. So I pulled my car, nobody around. He says, I sat on that rock. And I was just beautiful. I was looking all over the mountains. And so all of a sudden I looked down the road and there was three little white kids running toward me. <laughs> and they kept running. He said, I looked. And he said, I just got in the car and I just took off. <laughs> so anyway, thank y'all. So let's get right to it. I see a lot of faces in the crowd. You can probably tell a lot of the same stories I can. Um, but... This one kind of correlates with Margot's story and Polly's story about the superintendent's home. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Is this one working? No, it work. Um, so, this story, like I was saying, correlates with Margot's story and Polly's story about the uh, superintendent's home. I had my own... Uh, uh, encounter. So I had to go back to about 1998, 97, 99, somewhere in there. And uh, uh, the program I was working with, sometimes we got sent out with the maintenance guys because, you know, we just wanted something to do sometimes. So we got called in to go with the maintenance guys to set up for a meeting with the uh, Minerals Council. So they had this great big table in this little dining or dinner room, dining room or whatever. And this table's just big enough where you have to kind of scoot in to get to your seat. Because that's how big this table is. And uh, the rest of the maintenance guys, they're... they're they're, you know, happy in the fact that somebody else is going to do this setup instead of them. So we're like, we're going to go out and take a smoke break. You know, that was common back then. And uh, so me and a co-worker of mine, his name was Roger. So we would tell him, we, we'll, we'll set up the tables and stuff, or the chairs. So you guys go ahead. So they went outside on the front porch. And uh, Roger kind of disappeared. And then I just got busy setting up the tables, or the, the, the chairs, and uh, I said, Roger, come help me set up these chairs so we can all go out and have a cigarette. I smoked cigarettes back then, too. And uh, I heard a voice a moment ago to the restroom. 
I'm like, okay, I wasn't fully paying attention, you know, I could kind of see the, there's a, the doorway, uh, entrance way, you can kind of see the staircase from the angle that I was moving the chairs around, and I just mostly heard him you hear it go up the stairs. And there's a bathroom right at the top of the stairs on the left-hand side, and I could hear that door close. Okay, you know, I could hear the toilet flush, hear the door open. I could hear the sink running from him washing his hands. And so I'm thinking nothing of it. It's like I hear him coming down the stairs. I'm like, Roger, come help me out. Do this other side. It's hard for me to get over there. And nothing. So I scoot around, do the other side. And then I go outside. And there's Roger on the front porch. I said, how come you didn't come in and help me finish the chairs? He goes, well, I've been, I came out here with the maintenance guys. I was like, no, you went to the bathroom. You told me you were going to the bathroom. I said, no, I didn't go to the bathroom. I came out here with them. So I was hearing somebody walk around up there, talking to them, it kind of answering me. And <clears throat> yeah, it was about 10 years before I went back to that building. <laughs> and it's been at least 10 years since I've been in there since. <laughs> So, with that story, I have another story <clears throat> about the superintendent's home. But this story isn't my story. This is a story of a friend of mine that told me his encounter, one of his encounters. He had many, he was on maintenance. But after my story, when I set the table and stuff, this is probably, I don't know, seven, eight years later when I didn't knew I didn't want to go back in that house. So he's telling me about um, on maintenance and they're up in the upstairs room in one of the back rooms. Now, after I figured out that I had an encounter after it happened, I didn't want to go back up and find out what room this was. So um, he was telling me that they were all up there painting these rooms that had to be repainted. So they were putting coats and coats and paint on this one particular room and something orange kept bleeding through on this one particular wall. And uh, everybody was, I think it was lunchtime or whatever, so they all wanted to go to lunch, but this guy didn't. His name was Frank. And uh, so he decided to stay and keep putting coats on. He's like, I want to see how many coats it's going to take before it covers up this orange that's bleeding through this wall. So he's putting it on. Everybody else leaves. And he said, uh, there's a closet in this room. I think he said it had a sliding door, maybe French doors. I'm not sure. I think it was a sliding door. And uh, he said, he could see out of his peripheral vision, that door kept kind of open up just a little bit, about like that. And he'd be painting with the roller, and he'd go over there and close that door, you know. And uh, he'd go back over and start doing his painting again. He did that two or three times. And Polly was, or I'm sorry, uh, Frank was... He was very religious. He carried this little Bible in his, in his pocket all the time. So he pulls this Bible out. And he faces towards these doors, these closet doors, and he starts just reading. He told me what scripture he was reading. I can't remember. And uh, he said he is uh, just concentrating and focusing on looking at his little book and reading from it. So he's reading this small Bible and after a couple of minutes he sees the door start creeping open and uh, keeps coming open and keeps coming open and then not looking directly at it just with his peripheral vision he can see something come out of that door out of that closet and he's still reading and this thing he said is kind of kneeled down looking at him and it's growled much like the ground that Mario was talking about, a deep ground, he said, but this thing was real close to it. 
like it was circling like a like a some kind of animal. And it, he said the thing that he could hear, besides the growling, was it was grinding its teeth at it. And uh, he said he could, he never looked, he could s just see like the shadow of this thing. And he said it got right by his ear and started grinding its teeth at him and growling and just making a fuss, trying to put fear into him. Because these kind of things are said that they thrive on fear. So it went all the way around him and he didn't do anything, he just kept reading from the Bible. And that thing just kind of backed back into the closet. And he said, slam that door as hard as it could. As soon as he did that, he said he was out of there. <laughs> and I would have been too. And this would be a good place to end the story, but the story doesn't end here. So, a few days go by. Uh, weekend comes, weekend goes. And so, he's back at work, and they're all there at each other, trying to tease him, you know, let's go back, we're going to send you up there to put another coat of paint on that wall, you know, and I'm not going up and uh, he said after uh, about a week or so, he started getting phone calls from this superintendent's home. Uh, he said some of them were at midnight and some of them were at three o'clock in the morning. Now, this is where the police department was and dispatch and stuff at the time. Um, but only the, the, the thing, the strange thing was is they closed at regular business hours, which was world. They closed at five, I think. So at five o'clock, the dispatch left for the night. There's nobody in that building. It's locked up from five o'clock in the evening until 6.30 or seven o'clock the next morning. So he kept getting these phone calls from this place and had talked to the dispatch lady like she needed him to come up there right now at 3 a.m. And then another call. We need to come up here right now at midnight. You know, there's trouble. You know, one of the officers or something is like, well, I'm making this. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> this went on for two or three weeks afterwards. And he stopped getting the calls from, at least I, I think he did. But, uh, you know, that was a uh, great, great porn story. And, yeah, I don't want to go up there even more now. <laughs> so, and that's my story. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. What a crowd. I can't believe all these people are out here. This is great. But, um, okay, so I've got two little bitty stories I want to tell, and then I've got that have to do with the hill, and then the other one's about the village. And, but first, I want to say that I do believe in ghosts. I've had lots of ghostly encounters. I believe in spirits. Um, I believe there's good spirits and there's bad spirits, and it's hard to tell which is which unless you kind of know the key to all of it. I um, also will tell you that my dad said quit telling these stories because people will think you're crazy. <laughs> and I just can't quit telling them because they're really cool stories. So, and none of you know, I live out in the village and of course I've worked on the hill since about 98. And um, so I've had lots of encounters. I've been in that superintendent's house a million times. I'm the one that put the newspaper staff in there for about five years and made them work up there and they had to learn to cope with all the spirits and ghosts up there and stuff. But, and so I wasn't gonna tell these little stories till Margo told hers and so I can tack on to what she's, what she's got going. So, this is, um, and this is about some scaredy cats, because we used to have to go in that house all the time for all kinds of things. And so I was there one day and I was with uh, Harris Shackelford and Frank Redcorn, and there was two other guys that worked in maintenance then, I can't remember who they were. But we were over at that house doing something, probably getting ready to move a crew in or move a crew out or you know something like that. Anyway, so we're standing there talking, and there's two staircases in that house, one in the front of the house and one in the back of the house. And so we're, we're standing there, there talking, I think we were in the front of the house, and all of a sudden we hear water just gushing, I mean just pouring. And so we stand there and kind of start walking around a little bit, and then we realize it's down in the basement. 
So we go over toward the base, and I said, well, go down there and see what's going on. They all went, no way. I'm not going in that basement. And I said, you guys are nuts. So I just moved them aside, and I went down in the basement, and a pipe had, a pipe had shimmed off, and there was just water pouring everywhere. I said, get down here. We've got to move some stuff there. And I looked up at the top of that staircase, and they're all standing there going. <laughs> and they would not come down those stairs, not for nothing. So um, anyway, I wanted to tell that one. So then the next one, I've worked at the BIA, I've worked at the clinic, and I've worked with the chief's office, and so I've been in all those buildings. And people are right, at night when you're there, there's typewriters going, there's elevators going up and down, and you just get used to ignoring it while you're working. So this was, this was when I worked um, at the clinic, and we would really burn the midnight oil there and stay there sometimes we work till midnight one o'clock two or three of us and so this was a particular night when we were working really late and we what we do is pile all our kids up at my house and then that meant one of us had to leave and go get dinner and take it over there or go get movies or go get whatever to entertain them and back and forth so uh the girl i was working with she had left the building to go out and fool with the kids and then i was sitting there just working away at my desk and all of a sudden I saw a figure out of my peripheral vision come around the corner and come down kind of a little aisle way and go into the office next door to me. Well, I thought it was her, that was her office. And I really just didn't say anything and just kind of kept on working. I thought that's really odd that she didn't say anything when she came in, right? I'm back or, you know, the kids were doing this or something like that. But I was really involved in what I was working on. And then all of a sudden I see something come out of that office and come in and stand right beside me. And it was a white vapor. And I had never seen a spirit like that, a white vapor. Anyway, it was just a white vapor that was just there, you know, and stuff. And that time I thought, I don't know what this is. So I got my purse and I left out the back door. So, but like I said, for the most part, I really am not afraid of spirits. I'm more afraid of real people than I am of spirits. So, um, I live out in the village, and we are kind of protective of our spirits out in the village. Several of the houses have spirits. There's lots of stories that go on as we've grown up and stuff. And so um, different ones in different houses, a little boy in one house and different things. Well, my grandmother died in uh, 1996 on Sunday of the June dances. Now, she had been sick for a long time, and she was in a nursing home in Tulsa, and we were all up here for the dances. And in those days, I've got like 36 people in my family, kids and brothers and sisters, in-laws and outlaws and all that business. So in those days, this was in 96, kids were little, so we had cots all over the house, big people just sleeping everywhere. And I would always get up early and start the coffee. So I got up that morning, just woke right up, felt good, got up out, out of my little cot. <laughs> headed for the kitchen to make coffee. And just as I passed the threshold into my kitchen, my grandma's spirit passed right through me. And it was like a shock wave that went through me. But I knew it was her because I could smell, I could taste her, I could feel her. And more than anything, I heard her. And what she said was, oh, Paula, in the most wonderful, exuberant voice, and that she was, feeling good. And so that made me feel good. Now, when she would go into a coma, when she was in the hospital and stuff, I would have little experiences with her and, you know, tell my folks, well, she's calling me, I need to go up there and stuff like that. But this was different. This was powerful. And this made me feel wonderful. I said, if I ever needed a, com a confirmation of my Christian faith, that was it right there. So I felt good for just a moment there. And I never heard, I started making the coffee and I never heard him come in the back door, but my uncle came in the back door to tell me that she had passed. And then I realized what was going on, right? Okay, so that's normal for me, that's, that's what happened. But when she did that, this is what I believe, that when she did that, she opened up a gate. She opened up something, some kind of a portal, because she was one that did not believe that there were mean ghosts. She, did, she believed in her, her faith was powerful. But she did not believe, matter of fact, she was another one that was like, don't tell these kind of things because, you know, people will just think you're nuts. But it happened. It happened for real. 
but it didn't end there. And what happened was I began to have experiences in my house of people everywhere. And I mean literally everywhere in my house. It was to the point where I was having people come spend the night with me every night because I couldn't go to sleep. They wouldn't let me go to sleep. But if somebody else was there, I didn't notice it so much. So it went on for weeks and then months. And I was telling everybody, you know, they will not let me sleep. I don't know where they're coming from, but they're just they're everywhere. So as I would walk through, my hallway is just a little six by six room that connects all these rooms. And especially when I would walk through that hallway, there would just be people everywhere. So I walked through my house like this, because I thought, I don't want to make contact with them. I don't want to talk to them. I don't need to hear from them. And they don't need to hear from me. Just ignore them and they'll leave you alone. But they don't leave you alone. They just keep staring and staring. And, and, and like I said, the cold vapors and all that kind of stuff, you know, and the corners and stuff. And so I was telling everybody, I said, I need to have this house smoked, you know. Well, my uncles were just like, just go on. You're fine. <laughs> you don't, just don't pay attention. I was opening doors and I was opening windows and I was asking them all to leave and, because I needed rest more than anything. Well, in that experience and with all the other experiences, and I've had numerous ones of them, and especially with family members and stuff, I began to understand what was going on because I learned two things. I learned, first of all, that a lot of them carried a white handkerchief. And I had to figure out, and just one day, just all of a sudden, it just it occurred to me what that white handkerchief meant. And that white handkerchief meant they had something left behind that they needed taken care of. They were in mourning for something or someone here. Then the next thing, we talk about the little people. For me, those little people are not nice people. Those are little evil people. And so when you see those little dark figures that are down or close to the floor, then that's evil. So I don't talk to them at all, ever, and try not to talk to any of them and stuff. But that was the two little things I had to figure out for myself. I love my ghosts. I still hear one once in a while, or I hear something once in a while. I hear a lot of them when I'm at the dances. I appreciate them. I asked an uncle one time, "What? What? This is this is not a testimony. I promise. <laughs> this, is, this is about my ghosts." But I asked my uncle one time, "What did we believe, or how did we interpret death?" a long time ago in, in our old beliefs and stuff. And he said, there's four phases to our death and one of them is on this earth. And so I believe that's those people that they're locked here on this earth and stuff. And so when you see them or hear them, appreciate them and be good to them. But do not talk to those little dark figures. <laughs> those aren't something that's, that's good. So I wish it was a little scarier, but it wasn't or it's not scary to me. But anyway, thank you all. Thank you. How are you all doing? So, some of you may know this. Some of you might not know this, but I am a pastor. I'm the associate pastor at O.C. Janine Baptist Church here in Pahuska. And uh, my, my ghost stories are a little bit different than everybody else's. I don't really get haunted, but, uh, you know, when people get haunted, I get called a lot. <laughs> And they ask me to come over. They either want me to pray for their friend. They want me to pray over their houses. And I have, I have people ask me all the time. They're like, uh, are, you, are you afraid of ghosts? Or do ghosts scare you? I'm like, no. They don't scare me. Uh, I'm like, it's kind of hard to get scared of ghosts if you're performing exorcisms all the time. And they're like, what? What do you mean you perform exorcisms? I'm like, well, I'm going to share this story with you all now. Uh, I had a friend that was recently married and they moved into a house together and uh, they knew at the time, it was back in 2016, I was going to school at Victory Bible College. So it was before I went to Bay Cone. And uh, if any of y'all know about Bay Cone, Bay Cone's a pretty haunted place too. Everybody's got a story. And uh, sometimes uh, I'm in the building and they're always talking about the ghost stories and I haven't had any experiences with them. But uh, I thought it was interesting. I told my friends, if you ever have a problem with these kinds of things, call me up. 
I'll come over and I'll pray over your house for you. And uh, I'm like, we'll hold you to it. And I'm like, all right. Uh, I know in the Gospel of Mark, in the end in the Great Commission, it says, go forth into all the nations uh, and preach, preach to all of creation is what it says. And then uh, it says that one of the things that you'll do is that you will cast out devils. Also said that you would heal the sick. Uh, sorts of other things like that. But the key part of that passage I always like to point out to people is it says it's the believers that will do this, not the unbelievers. So one day I had my friends call me. He said, hey, we got some weird activity going on over here. I need you to come over. So I'm driving from Tulsa all the way to uh, Collinsville. And I arrived. And they had a gate around their house and a trail that leads up to their house. And as soon as I pass through that gate, I could feel something heavy on me. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. So I'm driving real slowly. I pull in and it just feels eerie. You don't hear anybody. You don't hear anything. It's just quiet. So I walk in, uh, knock on the door. He lets me in. And I said, before we do this, uh, you guys need to, need to pray. I'm like, God, there will be parts of this where I can't pray for you. you got to be able to pray for yourselves. And so I taught them a prayer. I'm like, in the name of Jesus, leave. Simple as that. In the name of Jesus, leave. Also, I said things like, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, be with you, protect you, things like that. And then uh, we started going around the house. We started in the living room. And we went to the bedrooms. All the cabinets were opened. And then uh, the one thing that I can remember from that night is uh, my friend, he was what I consider the head of the household, fell asleep while we were in the middle of praying. And I believe that the spirit went on him and tried to lay him out. So he, he fell asleep in the middle of our prayer. Excuse me. Excuse me. And I was, I'm, so I'm like, we need to keep praying and pray for him. When we got done praying, we all said, Amen. He woke up and he said, Amen. <laughs> and uh, he's like, it's so weird. He's like, I've, like, I've been on wide awake all day. I haven't felt tired. And all of a sudden, I just got tired and fell asleep. I'm like, well, it's because it's the enemy trying to stop you. And I'm like, and the scripture says, once you cast the spirit out, that it will go get its buddies and come back to you seven times stronger. You got to beat it then. You beat it then, it'll leave you alone for good. And uh, I said, you got to, uh, when when they come back, you let me know, I'll come back again. And we'll, we'll go through it, it'll be worse. <laughs> and they're like, okay, we'll hold you to it. I'm like, okay. About a month goes by, it's 3 a.m. in the morning. I get, my phone rings, wakes me up. And they're frantic on the other end of the phone. They're like, man, the doors are opening. They're closing. I got people pulling on my hair. I got, I've got i been kicked and scratched out. I got claws marks on me. We need you to come down here and pray for us. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm coming. So I roll out of bed and I get over there and it's a foggy night. And uh, this, I, could tell, I could tell this was not going to be a uh, pleasant experience. So I'm driving real slowly. I get I basically a repeat of last the last time I was there. And but this time the door was already open. I they could hear me coming up the up the porch and like, is that you? I'm like, yeah, it's me. Go ahead, go ahead, come in here. And they said they could see somebody walking around in the living room, the dining room. Cabinets are opening and closing, things are being thrown at them. <coughs> And I'm like, you got olive oil in your kitchen? And they're like, what do you need olive oil for? I'm like, have you ever heard of anointing oil before? You gotta put put oil on things, and you, it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit coming down as a protection. And uh, I want to put olive oil on all of you, and put olive oil on the entrances and things like that. And they're like, yeah, we got olive oil. So I went went in the kitchen, and they had a new family member in the house. It was his sister. And she was in the guest bedroom. And across her hall, 
across the hall in, in, uh, from her bedroom was another bedroom, but they were using it to tape it off. I'm like, what's, what's going on in that room? And like, we got black mold, so we taped it off. That way people don't go in there and get sick. I'm like, okay. And uh, so I prayed over everybody. I taught them how to pray. And I said, y'all need to go to different parts of the house. Y'all need to repent. Ask the Lord to, to come into your heart. Ask the Lord to protect you. Because what we're getting ready to do, you're going to need protection. And so they did so. They went to their rooms. And while they were doing that, I was praying for them that God be with them as well. And me. Because I don't want whatever this is to follow me home. <laughs> so ask the Lord. Lord, protect me, my friends. Uh, protect, protect us when we go to encounter this thing. And then we all came back to the middle of the room. And I'm like, all right. We're going to open up the prayer right here in the middle of the house. So when we opened up, we, we all did a prayer, asked the Holy Spirit to pour down like water, like like fresh oil. And uh, and then after we did that, I told him, now go, let the Holy Spirit lead you. If it's telling you to go over here, you need to go over there. You need to pray. And if it's telling you to go over here, you need to pray. And God's going to lead me to where he wants me to pray. So we all started praying. And doors are slamming. Things being thrown at them. People are getting scratched. And then uh, we heard somebody scream. Somebody was like, ah, freaking out. And it was his sister. She said she felt like she needed to go into that room with the black mold. So she broke that seal open, went in there. And when she came out, she was just screaming and she couldn't breathe. And most of the time, people write that off as, oh, that's the black mold getting her. But she said it felt like somebody had their hands around her throat so she would stop talking. And I told his, his, her brother that he needs to pray for her, and I started praying for them. And uh, she started to get to where she could start speaking. And I'm like, now you need to start praying. In the name of Jesus, let go of my neck. She said, in the name of Jesus, let go of my neck. And as soon as she said that, she gasped for air. She went, oh. And then I'm like, now you need to ask for the Holy Spirit to protect you, fill you, heal you, heal your spirit, physical, mental. And so when we started praying, and she started praying that, that left her. And we continued on praying for the house. She screamed again. And she said, I saw it. Like you saw what? She said it was in his, it was in her brother's lip, uh, bedroom. She said it looked like a man with a goat's head and horns that drooped from its head down its back, down to its waist. I'm like, we need to go in there now. So we went in there and started praying against it. And uh, she freaked out again. She's like, it's in the, she, she could see, she said she, she could see this thing. She said, it went, into the, it went into the closet. I'm like, well, we need to go here. And I'm like, this is the last room we prayed for. There's nowhere else to go. And so the last time I said, in the name of Jesus, leave. She said she could hear it scream. She said it sounded like something grabbed it by the ankles and dragged it out of the house through the ceiling. And I'm like, all right, so now this thing's out of the house. And then we pray for all the doorways and all the windows. And we put all of them on there. Man, they're listening to everything I'm saying. <laughs> they're all spooked. And I said, we need to pray over the doorways out, the doorways in. We need to pray for the windows. And we put oil on all the entrances, you know, kind of like how in Exodus they had to put the blood of the lamb on Passover, right? So we did the same thing with all oil representing the Holy Spirit. And we prayed that God would seal the entrance and no evil spirits could come back in here. And they won't be welcome on the property anymore. And then it was just me and my friend. And I'm like, since you're the head of the household, you're the one that pays the bills to your house. Follow, follow me. So we walked down the, this gravel road to the main gate that's on the property. And when we got to the gate, I'm like, you need to pray for protection on the gate. And nothing could even get on the property now. Now it can't be in the house. It can't be in the property. So he started praying. 
and I could hear something running in the gravel from the house, like full sprint, just and I look and I can see a tall figure and it lost its shape. I can I just look like a shadow and it passed me. And when I turned, the gate rattled real hard. And as soon as he said amen, I looked around and all the fog in the property was outside the property line. There was no more no more fog on the property, then all of a sudden all the dogs in the neighborhood started barking and freaking out. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> this thing's gone now. And ever since then, they believe in the power of prayer. <laughs> they pray all the time now. They go to church and all sorts of <laughs> things like that. So that that's my one of my scary stories. I have a whole bunch of others, but I figured I'd save them for next time. <laughs> Away. Talk about a tough act to follow. That was good, man. Um, yeah, I didn't grow up here, but my family's from Hominy. I'm, I'm Noah Kimohara. We sold the land to the Hominy Buck High School. And we, uh, we've got some land on Highway 20, so I guess I need to stop standing under trees because people are thinking I'm, I'm Bigfoot. <laughs> my mom would have loved that story. She's an Um so my story is actually from Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, I lived out there for quite a, a long time. But it did happen on Indian Hills Road. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you decide if it's a ghost story or just a weird coincidence. So I started having dreams when I moved out to this place. And I was the third person to live there. There'd only been two people that had lived there from the time that it was Indian territory. And so when I first moved out there, I started having these very vivid dreams that there was a, a whole band of Indians dancing <coughs> in sequence through the forest. And I'd see them over and over. And eventually, I started dreaming about a family of settlers and they would come up to the house and they were wearing clothing from the 1800s. And it was the same family and I kept dreaming of them over and over. And the first time it rained really hard, I was sleeping, I could hear the thunder and the lightning and I heard the thunder crack and a lightning bolt came through the window. And I opened my eyes and I looked up and that whole family of settlers was just staring down at me, looking at me. And then I woke up. I realized actually that was just another dream. So I woke up in my dream and then I woke up to reality. Nobody was there. And eventually those settlers started changing in my dreams. My dreams went black and white. And I started hearing this theme music. I'm not kidding, this is real. <laughs> And you know, the Adams Family, they're not scary when you watch them on TV. But when you start dreaming about the Adams Family, man, they're scary, I'm telling you. And I just kept dreaming of the Adams Family. It was black and white dreams. I was dreaming color. But all of a sudden, I'm dreaming black and white. Adams Family, and they just wouldn't leave me alone. That's so why I thought, okay, I gotta investigate. Now here's where the coincidence comes in. I went to the Norman uh, County Hall of Records, and I looked in the town uh, plot. Plot. I looked all the way back to the beginning, because like I said, I was only the third person to live in this land. And I had bought it from an old lady who was in her 90s. She lived there alone. She had bought it from the people that got it, and either in the land run or when it was opened up, the, the settler family. And I looked at their name. And the, the name on that book was James Adams. So the family that lived there was the Adams family. <laughs> maybe a coincidence, maybe a ghost story. I don't know. Hello. 
I don't, I don't know many of you. I don't recognize too many faces, but those that do know me know that I cook for many, many years for the Osage people, and I loved every minute of it. Except, and I got, I got a lot of stories I could tell, but I'm just going to tell this one. So I was always, there, you know, everybody was always telling me about the, you know, and the dear lady and the different things, and I'm a believer. You can make me believe. So anyway, we were camping at Grave Wars during the dances, and uh, everybody was leaving, you know, and we were getting ready to get our beds out and get ready to settle in. And so we woke up to the showers to take a shower. Well, the, a friend of mine that was there cooking with me had finished, and she said, well, I'm gonna go back to camp. And I said, okay, I'll be, I'll be right there. So I finished shower, you know, my shower, and I, and I was always told, don't ever look them in the eyes because they'll drive you, you know, they'll call you and drive you. So I, I remember that, but, so I got through with my shower and I was headed out the door and there's a little old lady standing there. She wasn't about this tall. She had a black shawl kind of hump, humped over. And I remembered that don't ever look them in the eyes, and so I didn't. So I went on and I could feel her behind me. So I kept walking and kept walking. You know where the gravel there separates the husband camp and the, the arbor. So I, just as I stepped on that gravel part, I was gonna look back to see how close she was. Well, when I turned around to look, that hill where that big tank this little old lady had ran, was run, had run down that hill, and just as I turned around and looked, she jumped that fence by, I mean, she cleared that fence by this much. And so I got back to camp, and I was telling my friend there, and she said, oh my God, what'd you do? I said, well, I just got to camp. I was hurrying, you know. Well, her brother was sleeping in the car. We, we had an old tent, or a camper, and then my car. Well, about five o'clock that morning, he comes beating on the door, beating, God, you guys, God, you let me in, let me in. So I rushed to the door. We never said a word to him about what happened to me. We're going, okay, what's wrong, Eddie, what's wrong? He said, God dang, he said, oh. he said, I heard something out there, and I opened my eyes. He said, there was something looking in the window like this. He said, I, I, I had to come. Well, the next day, we started talking about this story, you know, and he said, well, did you look at her feet? And I said, no way. No way. No way. But anyway, I got several, several more stories that I could tell you, but I'll tell you one more that uh, in Hominy, uh, we were cooking down there. Everybody had left. That's when uh, Eli had the drum, and uh, Eddie and Maddie, we were all cleaning up, and man, it started lightning and thunder, and I mean, just storming like. The wind was blowing and Eddie said, come on, you guys, we gotta get to safety. So we ran down the road to, he had a cousin that lived there. He was beating on the door, beating on the door and was trying to get in, get out of the storm. And it was, it just turned cold. And then we were just beating on the door, beating on the door, this hot, I mean, just like, felt like you stand by the fire and the wind blew and that, I mean, just hot. So she, his cousin finally lets us in, turns on the TV. There is nothing on TV about the storm. Nothing. So after the storm's over, we go back down to the camp. The porta potties are all turned over. The bowls are all out of the shelves, and uh, but there was nothing up to in town. Nothing. Well, we had camped there before, and we kept telling everybody that we heard a little a, a peyote girl down the creek. You know, down that. And Eddie said, well, "I believe you now." So, but, yeah, I have a lot of stories I could tell, but I'm not gonna really go into it because I was always told not to talk about it. <coughs> but I wanted to share that one story with you, so thank you. Oh, hey, Dante. Hey. Um, I wish I had my sister here, Abby, to, uh, to back me up on this. Uh, it was when my Aunt Mary Big Horse passed away and it was about maybe a week or two after, and uh, I was, it was just me and Abby at uh, my house in Indian camp, and she was saying, Bub, go make me something to eat. And I said, well, okay, well, what do you want? And she was like, I don't know, something sweet. So 
I said, uh, okay. So she was in my she was in my living room in, in my kitchen and all of a sudden we hear this big sneeze and I'm like, Abby, was that you? And she said, no, was that you? And we just ran out of that house. <laughs> and a lot of you know where I live on Indian Camp. It's an old Tinker home. And uh, I've lived there for about seven years now. And my other story that I want to tell is uh, when the dances was uh, the old Arbor and Pahuska. Me and my mom got into it fighting. I, I danced that Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And I said, Mom, I'm not going to dress tonight. Yes, you are. You start ironing. I was like, no, I'm not going to dress tonight. I'm just going to sit here and watch TV. I was being selfish. And my elders always taught me, you listen to your mom, your aunt, and your grandma, and you go dress. And I didn't do it that time. And uh, so our my room's on the other side of my house, and uh, my sister room is too. So. We had the door open and I was um, sitting there and I was just watching TV flipping through and that little person came out of my room and looked at me. I ran down to Patrick Louie. I said, I just saw something I'm not supposed to talk about. He said, what did you see? I said, I can't tell you because my elders taught me you don't talk about that kind of stuff. And so my two stories. <laughs> Hi, I was looking for some familiar faces tonight because I actually broke my teeth on that building right there. I didn't realize it until driving here that that was my very first investigation ever. Talk about like baptized by fire, that was amazing. Um, some of you will know my aunt, she actually retired from the tribe, um, working for you guys. Uh, Don Haney um, did a lot of, yes, she was, she, I loved her going away stuff. Talk about making me cry, y'all. <laughs> but um, back in, we were trying to remember what year it was, and it, I think it was sometime between 2010, 2012, and Chief Craig was the chief then. And she gets a call and she says, there's a paranormal investigation team from Stillwater. There's a paranormal investigations team from Stillwater trying to come into the superintendent's house and they've got permission. And they said they need somebody to watch the HR records. And the only reason I'm going to do it is because I know that this is what you dream about. So, she's big chicken. <laughs> so, uh, off we went. Um, she told me ahead of time, she said she probably won't get to go in there with them and do what they do, but you know, you're welcome to come along if you got your equipment, which I did. I collected everything. Uh, showed up with everything and was hoping somebody would call in sick. Guess what? Got my wish. <laughs> so, and they needed one more person, so I started unloading everything that I owned at that time out of the vehicle and get upstairs. And first place I go to is the place that she tells me about that they had heard little kids uh, giggling in the closet. So guess what I did? I went down and sat down in that closet and waited for something to happen. And it did. <laughs> so one of the things that you want to do as a paranormal investigator is you don't want to contaminate your evidence. By the way, retired military police from the United States Air Force. Um, you, I'm very evidence-based. If, if I can't prove it, it didn't happen. And that's what, I do. that's what I do. I'm actually a member of the Warren Legacy Foundation uh, for paranormal research, which probably most of you know their, their founders, Ed and Lorraine Ward, the ones that did Conjuring House, Amityville. Yeah, their grandson interviewed me. <laughs> so, anyways, I'm sitting in there waiting for it to happen, and then I gave them permission. Um, if you don't want something to touch you and you know you're in a haunted place, set your boundaries right away. You don't have permission to touch me. If you gotta say it out loud, say it out loud. Um, but I gave them permission to touch me, and I'm sitting there. And I said, guys, come over here. I said, I want you to put your hands on each of my legs. And there was two different investigators with me. They verified it. And they said, this leg is ice cold. Yep, that's exactly what I was feeling. So that was number one. Um, throughout the course of the evening, 
we had a ton of um, orbs that we were seeing on the, which I don't give a lot of credibility to orbs. Everybody's like, that's an orb, that's an orb. It's like, no, it's not. You didn't clean your house, that's dust. Um, so we see a lot of stuff. But when something's blinking and it looks more like a nucleus, um, when you see colors, those are definitely orbs. Um, so anyways, we had a lot of different things that happened that evening. Um, one of the girls was absolutely like, I ain't going in that basement. You were right on about the basement. <laughs> so who goes to the basement? <laughs> yes, in the last, it's happening. So we go down and it's dark. It is very, very dark, especially, you know, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. You're not seeing anything, but your eyes do adjust and you do have a sense of what's in front of you. And you can practice these things at home, you know, with somebody, if this is something that you're wanting to learn to develop for yourself, is turn the lights off. Have somebody walk up to you. And you'll, get, you'll develop your own intuitiveness on whether there's something in front of you or not. But there was something in front of me that after my eyes adjusted to the blackness of the black, it got more and more like I could not see. And then I started noting, noticing the ting tinglings in my body. Um, when I investigate a house, I am a sensitive. These three fingers, if I put them in a closet and they go kind of tingly, there's something there. If it's the left leg that gets chicken skin, it's close. Both legs, it's very close. If it gets like right up next to me, my whole body will tingle. Now, if my head starts scratching, it's on me, and I don't like that. I don't, I, I've learned how to kind of handle that sometimes, but sometimes they're very pushy. But that was, uh, that was an interesting night. But so anyways, after the investigation's over and we we're packing up to leave and stuff, um, everybody got their equipment out and stuff. My aunt was like, okay, we gotta turn, you know, the furnace and everything back on and stuff. And so, we're standing there at the door, trying to lock the door uh, with the key, and it's not locking. And you're like, oh great, you know, you can't leave the records. So it's about two in the morning, what do we do? And I said, well, let me go inside and see if I can lock it from that side. I said, you stay on the outside. And I'm sitting in there, and I will still remember to this day, out of all the hauntings I've ever been to, and I've gone to Waverly Hills, in lots of places across the United States. I will never forget the anger that that felt like from the house. It was like a scream. And it was, um, it was powerful. Whatever's in that house came through and it just sounded like, like it was deafening. And so I was like, okay, don't really want to do that too much. And I don't, I don't scare easy at all. I'm the first one to volunteer for stuff. But I was like, okay, who do we call? Because <laughs> we're not sleeping here. <laughs> so we went down and we called, you know, told the police department, hey, we can't get the door to lock. You guys are going to need to do more frequent patrolling tonight until we can figure out what the problem is. And um, anyways, that was my experience with the house. But one of, whenever you're doing your evidence reviews afterwards, we listen for electronic voice, uh, voice phenomena, also known as EVPs. And got a few good ones, but... There was actually a uh, singing and drumming that we could hear. And it was super, and I tried every place to look for it. I was looking at the cloud, I was looking in old drives and stuff like that, because I really wanted to bring that to you guys tonight. And I just couldn't find it. I think it was on a laptop that got stolen, so sorry about that. But, but I had to look for it so I could present it to you guys tonight, since we're not getting to go inside, darn it. But anyways, but yeah, it's, it's a really cool place, so. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you guys tonight. Thank you for verifying that and backing me up and telling another story. What I didn't tell about that last part, when I was in that house before, I could see my breath and I could feel that growl, is that it did say, get out. But I'm not going to say it this loud, what, what, what it said. That's not the story I want to tell, but I, what she just told me, I was, it was, I was over there going, Felt that, been there, and um, we should like be doing tours up there, making a little tours of money off that. But um, Paula, I'm going to turn it into a B and B now, so you can yeah. see. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to um, tell this story before I left, and this comes back to being raised 
My father was a full blood, my mother was half. My grandma Maddie, full blood, old school, all day long. But she taught us so many different ways about different ceremonies, even from like um, what women do when they, you know, when they uh, dress their first young girl or granddaughter, or when they put their son in, how they lay that blanket out, and you know, you have you ask someone a good person to dress that person. So she would always teach us these different ways, but when I was around, I would say 12 or 13, um, she had called my mom and said, I want Margo to come stay the night. And so she was, Grandma wants you to stay the night, I'm gonna drop you off there, over there. And uh, so I said, okay, yeah, I'll go stay with Grandma. And um, my grandma could tell, um, if, if she was here to tell the stories, you all would be huddled up because she can tell you some old school Osage scary things or ways. And, uh, uh, but she would just say it in the, just the sweetest little voice that just, she was just stuck, she just had that way. And, um, and she also talked that old Osage too, not how we learn it now, her Osage is a little different. And um, so, um, I go over there, and my grandma had all these groceries on the counter. And she had a little, like a du she lived in a duplex. And so uh, she goes, we're gonna, I'm gonna teach you how to make chicken fried pork chops. I said, okay. So she was showing me, having me do everything. And I noticed that she had all of her really good dishes all set up. She set the table, she had the, the blue and white, dishes, their, their fine china, the bowls, the glasses, everything, and had filled up the tea and all ready to go. And so we cooked mashed potatoes, chicken fried steak. We had green beans and new potatoes. We cooked all day, and I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know who's coming over, but I just can't wait, because, you know, we had, had everything. She made a cucumber salad with tomatoes and onions and vinegar. It was just a, a summer dish. So, um, we, she goes, well, let's set the table, and we set the food on all the plates. And then she set two plates in her kitchen, she had a small little kitchen, and she goes, well, let's eat. And I go, well, how come we're not eating in there, and who's coming? She goes, that's, that's for my, my relatives. I'm cooking for my relatives tonight. And I go, well, are we gonna wait on them? You know, I was like, I, are these relatives I haven't met? So anyway, she goes, no, we're gonna sit here. So we ate about, I would say about 5.30. So we eat our meal, and I'm just thinking, their food's getting cold. I'm rationalizing everything, and she's just calm. So then it was around 6.30. We do our dishes up, and I said, well, I guess they're not going to show. She goes, no, we're going to go to bed. I'm like, Grandma, it's like 6 o'clock at night. I mean, I'm going to watch TV or nothing. She said, no, so we're going to bed. So... And I told you, Grandma was old school. Um, so we're in bed, and she's always got like blankets, and this is summer, and no AC. And I go, Grandma, I can't even breathe in here. And she goes, just go, just go to sleep. So um, all the lights were off. And then I'd say around 2 o'clock in the morning, I can hear dishes moving in the, in the uh, dining room. I didn't hear voices. But I knew something was in there, and the, the uh, light was on. So I'm laying there, and I'm just trying to get Grandma to wake up. I go, someone's in the house. She goes, I know. And I go, well, she goes, just go back to sleep. It, you know, they'll be, they'll be gone. They're just here. I, that's where we can fix that meal for them. And she just whispered it to me. I couldn't go back to sleep. And then the hallway light came on. And then I just shut my eyes and, you know, just being a young kid, you didn't know. So then the next morning, I finally, out of fear, went to sleep. And I was saying my prayers and everything. And then the next morning, I woke up. And then that's when she explained to me, that's how we honor our old ones. That's how we remember when we say their name and we pray for them. And that's how she, she did that to honor uh, her mother, her aunt, her uncle, her brother, which, uh, and um, they're all buried down there in Hamdi.
And she showed me where they were buried. She goes, you always make sure you take care of these graves. But I think that's something that we should always remember that, you know, I wish she would have explained more to it, but Grandma, she was just old school. She'd just tell you one time and that's it. We've talked about it. So with that, I wanted to say that um, she also said, when you go to bed, don't hang your arm or put your feet off the bed. That's when LPs can touch your, your hands. And take you. So that's just, that comes from Grandma and Daddy Leftfield people. I'm <laughs> that's what she said. And the other is you don't whistle at night. We all heard that one? Yep. Don't be whistling at night. The other is don't be waking up laughing around in the morning. I'm one of these people that wake up and I'm in a, I'm in a uh, good mood. And she goes, no. She goes, you laugh in the morning, you'll be crying at night. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. But you know, it's just all these, these stories. That's what the old one said. You, when you get up in the morning, you pray first thing in the morning. You cry for our, our people that, our ancestors, our old people. So uh, those are just little things that, you know, my grandma taught me, but I just want some of these younger people to hear. So with that, thank you. All right, hello everybody. Uh, I'm not much of a storyteller like my dad or, you know, a bunch of other people, but uh, there's been a couple of questionable moments. <laughs> uh, I grew up in the camp. I know I see a lot of my neighbors here, uh, down there, and, um, you know, I never never was scared of anything, really. Nothing really bad happened, and I was, uh, so, uh, you know, we always ran around and played in the creek or swam in the creek or, you know, did whatever. And, uh, but there was this one time that uh, a group of my friends, we were playing down at uh, Ed Red Eagle Park. And, you know, it's kind of connected to that uh, creek. And it, it became, I think it was like sunset, close to getting dark, and uh, my, my friend's mom came and picked, picked everyone up. And I, I just lived across the field. I mean, it's, you know, two minute walk at best. And, and so I was like, oh, no, no, it's all right. I just, just kind of just walk over there. And so, so they drove off and I was walking back and, you know, just doing whatever, kicking rocks, looking for snakes or whatever. And I looked over and just at the like edge of the curb, kind of up ahead, there was something standing there. And at first I didn't pay it no mind, but as I kind of look, really looked at it, it looked like a, a bird, some kind of bird, I don't know. I'm like, I, I, at first I thought it was an owl, but maybe it wasn't. And I just saw it kind of move like maybe it was, you know, uh, hurt or something. So kind of try to move around it, but my eye was, was on it. I was not. <laughs> and all of a sudden it just kind of started like flapping its wings a little bit. And it almost looked like it started running after me. So boy, I took off smashing, man, my, I was going home and I swear I made it home in like 10 seconds. <laughs> long, long time and uh, I think, uh, I can't remember what we even had. I remember I sat down and the food was ready, I think, and it was like hamburger helper, piece of like butter bread. So I forgot everything else. But, but then I went to bed, went to sleep and kind of tossed and turned and went out and I, I went, I was in a pretty deep sleep, but I, I woke up and I could hear like this. And it sounded like it was coming from like directly above me. Like there was a, a roof above the roof outside. And I just, I was like, oh, shit. So I, I hopped up and I've, uh, I woke up everybody in the house. <laughs> Everybody's getting up and I don't know. It was, uh, it was pretty, pretty spooky. I don't, I, don't, I don't know, I was like, what does this mean, dad? <laughs> Couldn't tell me. Well, some of you know I've been visiting here for about 34, what, 34 years now, give or take. So I'm originally from uh, Penobscot and Malice, and I come out, I grew up on an Indian island up in Maine. So I'm going to tell you a couple stories about Indian island. Indian island was kind of spooky. 
So um, this one time, my, my friend, the way, the way Indian Island is, is you have the head of the island where the bridge is, and you have this one road that goes through the whole reservation. And it goes all the way around, makes like a big circle. And there's a, the there's a highest point in the county is on our reservation. It's this hill, it's called Oak Hill. A lot of people live on it. And then there's a pond, so you go up to the Oak Hill, then you go down over this other hill. My, my family's property is right, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my family. My family, my, gra my grandmother's parents and hit their parents and a couple generations back was the last hereditary chiefs of the Penobscot Nation. So the house that she lived in was called, um, it was called the Governor's Mansion. And that's where the, where the leadership of the tribe lived for a long time. And then, you know, when, when the white, when we made our treaties with the white men, they, they furnished this house with all the new furniture and stuff. And, and all my, my elders, I see pictures of them, they're all sitting on the floor because they, the, the furniture was uncomfortable. So they didn't like sitting in the furniture, so. But there was this house there. And then you, and then when you go down this hill, the backside of Oak Hill, there's, there's a bog, like a swamp, like a swamp there. And then, and then, the, and then, for like a quarter mile, there's no lights. It's just dark, dark road. And then you, then you'll come to like where our agency is. It's like the police station, the community building, Slot Alexis Arena. All these places really lit up. Uh, Indian Island School, the new one, which isn't new now, but it was new then. So I, I've been up at my friend's house. My friend, uh, his name's Sean Neptune. I, I stayed up with, I used to hang out up and watch movies and do other things, but, so I was hanging out up on the, on the up, up with him and it was about midnight, so it's in the middle of summertime. So I started walking back to my house, which my, you had to go, you had to go down the backside of Oak Hill and across this dark area to, uh, to get to my house, was was River Road, was a little bit north of Sock Alexis Arena, so it's almost half a mile from there. So I'm walking home. And I get about, I, I cross under the last light, and, and then I'm about halfway down this, this dark part of the road, and I turn around and look, because I can hear something behind me, and I turn around and look, and there's this, there's this black dog under the light, big old black dog. And it, start, it goes out under the light, and then passes into the, into the darkness, and then I can hear, like that. And I, and I look, and there's a man, a tall man, running towards me. So I stop running. So I'm like, hold me. So I said, I'm running. You know, I'm about 17, so I'm not as tough as I think I am. So I'm like running, and, and I get to the lights, and I ride out into the lights. I'm by the police station. I turn around and see what's chasing me, and that black dog comes running out under the lights. And that was creepy. Because it, it was a person, I know how <laughs> it was a person, man, and that freaked me out. Uh, another time, uh, like I told you about my, my grandmother's home, my grandmother's home was, so my mother, my mother moved away from the reservation, was res away from the reservation for about 30 years, and my grandmother left with her. So my mother moved to Connecticut with my father, and my grandparents used to live in that house on Indian Island, abandoned it, and moved to the reservation, which was full of all this really nice furniture and things. And uh, my, my mother said she had a mirror in her, in her house that was like eight feet tall by like nine feet wide. It was like to cover the whole wall. And it, was, it had like a gold frame, real heavy thing. I, I'm not... If I'm correctly, I think maybe it was made of metal, like a mirror that was made of metal, not really glass. Anyway, they, she said she, when she was a little girl, she used to talk to people in the mirror. So she'd see people in the mirror and she'd talk to them. And she was never afraid of them because she believed that was our, our, our elders that were visiting her in the mirror. So anyway, they went to Connecticut and about 10 years later, these people went in our house and stole this, stole a bunch of stuff out of this house. Took, took furniture, sold, I guess sold it and stuff, you know, and it ended up, this mirror ended up all the way down in the Carolinas and this family had it. And uh, 
So, so we had moved back to the reservation. We were living on, uh, living in River, uh, River Island after all this had happened. We were living in the house. And my mother gets a phone call and I can hear her talking and she's real angry. And she hangs up the phone. And, uh, and I was like, Mom, everything all right? And she's like, uh, that woman that took my, took my mirror wants, wants me to, uh, she wants to give that back. I was like, okay. She said, well, the little girl, their little girl was sitting in front of that mirror and said they would talk to the people in the mirror for a while. And my mother told her, said, you, you had no right to come in our home and take that. So nothing good's going to come from that, so you can keep it. It's yours now. Well, she kept it. And um, we get another phone call, and they're frantic. They want that mirror to come back. They, like, take this mirror. And uh, they said that that mirror fell on their daughter. I don't know if, if it lived or if she lived or died. I don't, I don't know. But, and my mother told her, said, no, you should never have took that. And now it's yours. You keep it. So that's the probably the scariest story I know of, of any hauntings in my family. We, <laughs> I've seen the pictures of, of the mirror too. So it has a, there's a picture of this man in, in uh, dress blue marine marine uniform. And my my uncle Lawrence passed away. He had he'd been killed in Vietnam, and he looked just like him. So so that's uh, I never I never felt cre I heard all kinds of stories about my grandparents property and being haunted and stuff being thrown at people and all that stuff but I know even I had some person go up there and try to bless the property and they got told to get the hell out of here Penobscot but it but I never I never had a problem with any of that I figured it's just because of my family they didn't want to go around but uh <laughs> that's that's all I got it uh huh they they can't say uh huh Tio kadeka ha angat si peta ha de hiko ora ki angat si angat ka eta de la de ajmi de Krista ka de ampa de eta wajaje i e ena konda ka eta de konse ha ila itse. So I was uh, invited here by Chris Hill personally, and uh, he he told me he wanted me to talk Osage and tell a story, and so I'm going to do that now. Goti Bakhawadani Bakhawadani Numpehi Numpehi Wadlipe Nikashia Wadashti Te Numpea So long ago, there was a mountain that used to swallow people whole. And they, uh, it was always hungry. Bako wadani no pehi nikshe. Shimiji, dami dakli kipahampe. Kapum, le waras tutape. So they picked three girls, and that mountain <laughs> swallowed them up. Shina eki on pia. And they did it again. They sent another good girl. And that mountain swallowed her up. And the wali wajonjipe. The whole village was struck with the terrible grief. And they began to wail, Khagiapa. Just Khagiapa. Oh, Wahodake win tea. And then all of a sudden came a, an orphan. Bahu Wadani Teade. He said, I can, I can kill the mountain. So he went, he went up to the mountain. 
der Bach Aka hat seht ihr ha wie steht da Anna Anna steht da Anna steht da die Hau Gott hat den Bach Wadania Wadania steht da ja so he got to the top of that mountain he, he said me too swallow me and then the mountain swallowed him up and then man said da man said da he be ha wa hu san e na e la pi a so he got to the bottom all he saw was white bones bone dry gashi mi shikena a he be he was there where the girls were Dingape, they were gone. Kakota Wahaneke Khamahi we are dinpe. Kakota the dance come Babahape. And so he had that knife, that that orphan, he had a knife, and so he went up to that mountain and he cut the artery of the heart. Oh, this orphan that I have swallowed is making me nauseous. Kukakhape. Kukakhape. Kakuta. Shime shizani. Jokhape. Eta de akshipe. So, after that, he made, he made them come back up. He threw them up. And then all the girls were there. And they went back and they made it home. Akshitya ha zani ha pa wajawa tia. All the village, they was all so happy. Kakata, the shimi shitakli kupe de wagrankata. And so they gave him those four girls to take his wives. Kakuna. Man, let's give him another round of applause. That's the beauty of the Osage Nation. Again, at this time, I'd like to call the Osage Nation Museum staff and leader uh, to come up so we can recognize these guys. All you Osage Nation Museum workers that help put this on, come on up. Y'all come up here. I want you guys to introduce yourselves so people know who helped put this on. Piyaki Opa Wajaji Jaji Abri. Marla Redquin Miller Istahi Ajaji Abri. Abri. Wahakali Nikisha only Minkshe. Sija Washtaki Dalali only Minkshe. Dai Bashe. John Horshi Jaja Bri. Jaja Wajaji Watseta. Zanjali only Minkshe. Thank you for being here. Jordan Hishdana Jaja Bri. Humpa Donka Wajaji Jaja Bri. In full disclosure, I've actually been on PTO this week, so I didn't help as much as everybody else, but um, it's a wonderful event. Happy to be here. Hello again. Uh, Noah Shadow. I just wanted to say uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this, this was a really good turnout. We had a lot of people coming. It, it, was, it was fun to hear everybody's stories and laugh around and even get uh, spooked a little bit. So, uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. My name is Julie Cote. I am the uh, customer service representative. I sit at the front desk of the museum. And uh, I keep count of people. We officially have 188 people. All right, uh, Miss uh, Marla has a story for you guys. A couple, little, a couple of stories, just really short. And also just wanted to thank the staff, and especially John Horse Chief really worked hard to pull a lot of this together, uh, coordinating with Chris and Veronica, and I wanted to thank them very much tonight uh, to make it you know, flow like it did. 
and also to encourage everybody to bring those stories up and hear all of them has been really great. So I'm going to tell two short stories. One is we always get people in the museum from all over, like all the departments, you know. Sometimes they're in search of things for themselves. They're here for different a variety of reasons. We had a couple come in who are ranchers, and they were living outside of Austin. And they said they loved to go to tribal museums. And they would go to all these different tribal museums, and then they came to ours because they would travel around and go into more rural areas and things like that, and that's one of the things they like to do. But the man was in search of something. And as he was going into the temporary gallery where we rotate the exhibitions, he came along the image of John Joseph Matthews. And then on it, you know, the description is in the content on there. And he came up to me with a very surprised look on his face. And he said, you know, my wife and I go to all these tribal museums and we've been in search of something. And he said, what does Wakanta mean? And I said, well, in my best understanding, it means God. And he was just like, wow. And he said, I've been looking and seeing, and I'd asked different people, and they didn't know. And he said, I was out on my ranch, and I was out by myself. And he said, this huge wind came over me, and it said Wakanta. And that, that was something that happened that I thought was really, really moving. And then the other thing, and you know, people talk about the museum being haunted, and, and you know, I you know, believe in spirits and things like that. I haven't really had any experiences like that, but maybe a couple. And this one's a little humorous. I've been working late, and I had a lot of things, you know, going on. My, you know, and I had my backpack and my, all the things that I was getting ready to take home and get in the car and take it home and everything. As I got to the door, you know, that back door on the west side, it opened up for me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. And I just like that. <laughs> but thank you guys so much for coming, and thank you again for Chris and Again, uh, I want to ask one question. Does anyone know why that house had a widow's walk? I mean, a widow's walk normally is for the ocean and watching. And it's like when you took the widow's walk off, you maintenance people, did you blow the ghost in? And if you hear screaming tonight, we're staying at Rain's on Walk. <laughs> Can anybody see? Can anybody know why it had a widow's walk? Yeah, yeah. As I said, this is the old ancient house. This is the first building on that hill. This is a very old building. If you take that porch off, it's it's just like this, uh, they have a city hall building, that one next to it, they call it the Chamber of Commerce. It's built just like that. So this is 1800s building. And the, one of the original pictures we have is Osage warriors in cropped hair. Brother right here, in blankets on. That's how we wore our hair back in the old days. On the widow's walk? And then um, they had the, and did you see the men standing on the second floor? There's no porch there. And so the top of it, you know, you could see down into the city, down into the valley, but also behind there. So we think it's, you know, kind of a, a lookout. For the whole area, you could see forever. You know, back in the day, there wasn't very many trees around here. You know, and it was rolling plains and grass. So it's just got a lot of history. This is a very, very old building. And when they were working on it, at first, they were getting strange things every day. Every day, something, they go to lunch, come back, the tools would be outside. They were getting kind of spooked, but after, as work progressed, everything just kind of got left alone. And we think, you know, maybe it was whatever was there just understood that we want to improve the building. That's what we did. And so, you know, I really like this building. The walls are 22 inches thick. The windows are old style. I mean, it's a very old building. And then the old floor, they covered it up, you know, and the, the stonework, it's just a very, very old building. Hope that helped you. I want to add to that too, because this is the superintendent's house. It, was it the agency too, before? 
Yeah, figured. Um, I've worked in event. I work in museums too, and I've worked in the uh, Five Civilized Tribes Museum in Muskogee, and um, it's also the first agency building, and it's built on a hill, and it has a lookout, just the same thing, because these folks, when they first moved into these areas, were very afraid of the tribes, and so that was uh, that's, that tracks because that same building in Muskogee looks that way too. Um, that one, I, I think, I don't know how rugged the Osages were, but later on with that building in, in Muskogee, they realized that these the natives in that area were a little bit more friendly, and they moved it downtown off that hill, but um, very soon after that, but um, that's also that same, kind of same build. Sandstone has a second floor porch and balcony, and it really, I do think that's, what they built it for, and they had the same kind of things in mind there. Well, again, I just want to take this time and thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight.